time for us to check back in with Louisa in Mountain Path. If you've missed any of the previous readings, you can look in the description below for a playlist. I can't make out what she's wanting, Chris said. Beetle, you've plumb spoiled mine and teacher's checker game. Louisa hurried from the kitchen into the big house with the lamp in one hand and a piece of cornbread and molasses in the other. Here, Beatty, try some nice bread. Hungry, Beatty? Beetle quieted her well and long enough to stare scornfully at the bread and wave a small fist dangerously near the lamp and then butted her head against Chris's shoulder, stiffened her whole body, and once more gave herself up to angry howling. Chris walked the floor and frowned and patted Beetle on the back. Teacher set the lamp on the mantel and tried walking behind Chris and amusing Beetle with the sock doll she had made for her. But the baby, after one look, would have none of the doll. Pete, awakened by the noise, sat up in bed and blinked in the lamplight. Ain't Mom got back from meeting yet? he asked. No, Chris called, and do you know what Buck Beetle could want? Pete leaned his chin on his drawn-up, quilt-covered knees and thought a time. Try teacher's shoes, them little red heeled ones Beetle likes to chaw on. You know, teacher, them she got a hold of the last time us young uns was up in the loft room. I know, Louisa said, and caught up the lamp and dashed up the stair hole and brought down the tiny red-heeled slippers, wondering as she came if they would quiet the baby and why she had brought such shoes to Cal Valley in the first place. She pushed a slipper over Chris's shoulder, waited anxiously for Beetle to unscrew her eyes enough to look at it, and then held her breath while she peeped, prepared to stiffen herself and howl again, changed her mind and reached a tear-stained hand for the shoe, which she caught by the toe, wrapped the heel smartly on Chris's ear, and cried, Woo, woo! She's a-driving a wagon with it like Lee Buck taught her to do with his brogans, Chris explained, and set her by the hearth, where by degrees she grew happy as she scooted the shoe over the hearthstones. It's a pity to ruin your shoe like that, teacher, Chris said, sinking down by the checkerboard. But if you'd let me buy you another pair, I'd say it was worth it to have her quiet. Louisa watched her, glad to have her quiet again, but with a heart bleeding for the red slippers. They had come from Pax Fifth Avenue last year before she knew that she no longer had any money and had cost more than five pairs of the shoes she now wore. She did wish a little that Beetle might have found her other shoes equally interesting. I wonder what's keeping Mom and the others so late, Pete said, still blinking from the bed. Maybe Lee Buck's getting saved, Chris said. They couldn't save Pop in one night. It'd maybe take five or six. He plays setback and the fiddle, and the preachers always say that the devil'll get you for both. And Pete sighed a little in thinking of his father. I think it was your move, teacher, Chris said, and dived for Beetle, who had every appearance of ready, being ready to throw teacher's shoe into the fire, but changed her mind just as Chris reached for her. The checker game was not finished yet when Corey and Rye and Lee Buck came. Well, teacher, I see Beetle's awake. How'd you and Chris get along with the young'uns? Fine, Louisa said, with no heart to complain of Beetle, who now looked unusually angelic as she sat and chewed teacher's shoe and stared into the fire. How was church? Meeting was good. It was right good. Ellie Stegall got might nigh through. She's as far toward being saved as she'll get, Lee Buck said. She's backslid four times and been baptized twice. She'll be in the shouting tomorrow night, Corey insisted. Teacher, I want you to be there and see. I mean to really shout over that woman, me and Sally, too. Louisa was perplexed, especially when she saw that Chris was laughing, a thing he seldom did. Uh, but yesterday you were so mad at her, and now you want to see her saved? I'm a-wantin' to see her saved, and I'm still mad, her a-tellin' the hainted cave folks that I was a-visitin' them in Yannian, big as life, and that me and some of them was thick as lasses. 
It's nice, Louisa said with grave piety, that you still want to see her saved and all. Corey looked at her a moment, her brown flecked eyes full of sly smiles. Teacher, I can hypocrite it before them preachers and deacons, but I can't to you. You believe everything. What she and Sally are aiming to do is to plumb beat the tar out of that woman, Lee Buck said, looking at his wife, half in admiration, half in doubt as to the outcome of her project. That may sound mean, teacher, but she's been needing a good whacking up a long time. She's always a telling tales, and this is the only way I can think to do it and not get talked about, Corey explained. Now I want you all to come, teacher. You had ought to see what good shouting really is, and Chris, you'll like the singing. Louisa glanced quickly at Lee Buck, a question in her eyes. Oh, he'll be all right, Corey said quickly, her mind so filled with her own plans that for once the trouble that haunted her from day to day was put into the background. He'll be all right. All the cows will be there. If somebody did come, they dasn't get him. They might see, Louisa began and stopped. Chris's handsome face was gathered into a slight frown. He disliked for teacher to make his trouble her trouble. She said nothing more and tried to lock her thoughts away, just as Corey seemed to do. It was easy not to think while riding to church, for the following night was clear and frosty with the Big Dipper bright above the pine tops on Schoolhouse Hill and a glowing Milky Way from Kinder's Mountain to Pig Waller Knob. The services began early, and in order to get there on time, it was necessary to leave at dusty dark. The cows and the meese boys from down by the river set out together, some riding mules and some walking. Lee Buck alone of his family walked. Teacher sat side fashion behind Chris on old Kate, while Corey rode Ma with Beetle in the saddle before her and Pete and Rye behind. All walked and rode slowly, calling to each other through the thin darkness, broken and brightened by the flickering of carbide lamps, kerosene lanterns, and an occasional pine knot. The women told each other of the activities and accidents transpired in their households during the day, and the men made slow speech of roads and crops and politics, and the man a deputy had killed over by Mount Victory. The church door was reached at last, and all were gratified to see that church had not yet begun, having as it did no set time, but commencing when there was a good-sized crowd and all the choir preachers and outstanding members of the congregation present. Lee Buck and Chris, with others of the less religious men, remained outside. For those who had mules with them, this was a necessity. Young boys of the neighborhood were not above cutting a mule's bridle rein so that its owner must walk home with troubled thoughts of a stray mule, which is in its fashion a much more troublesome thing to deal with than a stray soul. Places in the choir were reserved for Corey and Sally, while Louisa sat with the children farther back in the house in the zone of the less zealous. Shortly after Corey's arrival, the singing began. There was no musical instrument, but Matt Hardgrove led the songs with the help of a tuning fork and not a little do do ra ra men and fawn. Louisa enjoyed the songs. Far Away Beyond the Starlit Sky was her favorite. The melody was high and sad with an eerie remoteness that made her creature of reason that she held herself to be think of a place on the other side of the stars as they sang. She liked especially to watch the women and young girls sing, fitting their tongues to the words and sending out the high wailing sounds with little thought for the song itself. Yet at times their faces would come alive and one could see that they, for the moment at least, believed implicitly in a land of golden streets and joys untold. After the songs came long seasons of prayer followed by sermons from three preachers, each of whom quit only when he had shrieked himself hoarse and arrived at the point where every second sound was a gasping, uh, for breath. When Brother Peter Dykes, the last, had fallen exhausted into his seat and sat wiping tears from his eyes and sweat from his forehead, the choir broke into the quick strains of, Tomorrow's sun may never rise, so why not tonight? 
Other songs followed. The prayers become louder and longer with the cries of Amen and God bless you, brother, from members of the choir and front benches coming with louder frequency. The children who had fallen asleep during the two-hour harangue awakened, the babies crying and whimpering for the breast, the older ones rubbing their eyes in wakeful expectancy. The choir was singing, I've got a brother gone to glory. I've got a brother gone to glory. Keep your lamps trimmed and burning for the other shore. When an explosion of human energy occurred at the mourner's bench, which for a time threatened to turn over the pulpit, shake down the stovepipe, and cause the kerosene lamps to fall, Ellie Stegall had seen the true light at last. All the pious cried and shouted their loud and happy felicitations, whereas nothing compared to Corey's. Immediately upon Ellie's leaping to her feet with a loud, Praise God, I've got the Spirit, Corey, who had long since quitted her place in the choir in order to pray over Ellie, had jumped to, literally, springing out of supplication into happy thanksgiving. Shouting with all the power of her lungs, she fell to slapping Ellie on the back and shoulders, the zeal of her religion and sisterly love being equaled only by the weight of the slap she bestowed on the convert. Sally shouted too and wrapped her arms about the perspiring neck of Ellie while Corey piled slap on slap. Corey's long web of dark brown hair untangled itself from the pins that sought to hold it and streamed in a flying cascade behind her shoulders while her round old hat of a fashion forgotten ten years before remained jammed on her head with a racket, rakish slant to one eyebrow and an ear, but the condition of her hat and hair in no way hindered her exertions. Rye and Lander were scarcely able to contain themselves with admiration for their parents, and in their eagerness to see all that was taking place, stood on the bench seat, raising themselves on tiptoe. If and Mom don't look out, she'll plumb whack the hide off Miss Steagall, Rye whispered with satisfaction. Louisa herself was beginning to fear for the skin of the convert. I never seed Mom act that way before, Lander said to Mabel with some pride. Mabel answered him only with a slight gasp of breath, and Louisa, for the first time in some moments, turned her attention to the other children sitting farther down the bench. They, it was plain, did not understand just exactly what their mothers were about. Mabel was nigh well choking with her efforts to keep back sobs, while Pete cried in shame-faced silence. The babies were asleep, Beetle with her head in Pete's lap, and Sally Hayes's fat youngest stretched stomach downward across Mabel's knees. Louisa herself was beginning to tire of the noise and used the frightened children as an excuse to go outside. Rye and Lander wanted to stay for the finish, but the others at present preferred the sober company of their fathers to the side of their crazed mothers. The crowd of men and boys close-packed about the door, all with necks craned to see what was going on inside, opened a path for the teacher with a sleeping baby in her arms and three sobbing children and a baby behind her. Finding the fathers of the children in the crowd of men, many of whom were drunk, would have been impossible, so she took the children to a clump of small oak trees a short distance away from the trees to which Chris had tied the mules. She bedded the babies on saddle blankets and gunny sacks Mabel brought from the mules and sat to wait what someone's coming, beguiling the children with a story of three little pigs and herself with the stars and bits of the conversation of two drunk men a few steps away discussing potato digging and saving grace. Someone had built a bonfire over the hill just below the mules. Louisa could not see it, but its glow spread enough to lighten the darkness somewhat. She felt safe sitting there, her mind but half taken up with the words on her tongue. Tomorrow was Saturday, and if the weather held, she and Chris and the children would go to Jackson's Ridge for chestnuts and chinky pins and wild grapes. If it rained, she and Chris would squirrel hunt. She caught herself wishing that it would rain. Chris liked to walk in the rain, so he had said, and so did she. She thought about Chris and wondered if he stood by a window where lamplight might fall on his face. But he would be safe. Everything would be all right. The other end and the violin in the rain and Chris's trouble tonight seemed but half-remembered dreams, not half so near as the stars. Beetle slept so quietly by her knee and the stars were so big and the night so still. 
She was for the third time telling of how one little pig rolled over the hill in an apple barrel when Mabel, who had been sitting a short distance away with Jack on her knees, called to her in a whisper. Somebody about Lee Buck's mules, teacher. It's maybe some boys are going to cut them loose, Pete said and got up. Mabel jerked him to her. Don't be a-going over there. From what I can make out, them ain't no boys. It's somebody a-hiding like. I been a-watching. Louisa thought of Chris, and her throat grew dry and her hands cold inside their heavy woolen gloves. She tried to see, but could not. In the red glow of the dwindling bonfire, they loomed as nothing more than thick, indistinct shadows that might have belonged to the trees or the mules. She arose and lifted Beetle into her arms. Mabel pulled at her dress. I wouldn't be a-going. Them men is too quiet. I must go and see what they're up to, she whispered. Pete, you come with me. But Mabel, you stay here. What are you aiming to do, Mabel asked. I don't know, she said truthfully. I'm going a little nearer. I can hold Beetle. No need to carry her. I'd rather do it this way. Come on, Pete. She caught the little boy's thin shoulder and tried to see down into his face. Are you awake, Pete? Real wide? Yes, teacher. Pete, if we go to those men, can you remember not to call me teacher and to say nothing of Chris? It wouldn't do, he answered with that sudden relinquishing of all childish ways, a transformation peculiar to Cal Valley children when they spoke of or thought on certain things. What can I call you, teacher? Call me, um, call me Sue Annie. Sue Annie. Can you remember that? Yes, yeah, Sue Annie. She forced herself to walk slowly toward the men. It seemed a long way. Chris would come walking into the circle of firelight and the men would look at him and know him for what he was and take him away. Only when they took him, he not, might not be walking. Beetle cried a little and clutched for Louise's breast in her sleep. She quieted her, taking no care to be silent. She must not seem to come creeping up on the men. It was better that they hear first a child's cry and not footsteps that they might be wary of. The men had not noticed the baby's cry for all about the churchyard were women herding sleepy children home. Church was breaking up with only the newly saved, the preachers, the mourners, and those who prayed with them remaining. She came within a little distance of the mules and stopped and looked but could see nothing. She called then, Is that you, Les? A man shadow emerged from the tree shadow and turned so that she saw his profile in the red light but could not know him for friend or enemy, only that he was strange to her. I'm afraid you've come to the wrong bunch of mules, lady. Beetle cried and she soothed her and rearranged the blankets before answering. Ain't them Lee Buck cows mules? There were two shadows now, motionless, looking at her she knew. The heads of the shadow emerged, emerged and seemed to whisper. They drew apart, and one the taller who had already spoken stepped closer and said, Are you Miss Lee Buck cow lady? She thought a moment. I surely don't look that old. She's got a half-grown girl. You live over Cave Creek Way? Me? I wouldn't live in that hole. Ever since Les, that's my man, got laid off in Cincinnati, we been a-staying there. Kin of Lee Bucks? We're no kin to them cows. We just live close. Lee Buck said we could take his mules to fetch the youngins home. Uh, you want to see Lee Buck? The man seemed to consider. Well, not really, wanting to see him. More like wanting to know something. Maybe I'd know. Well, uh, ever hear of a man named Chrisman Bledzo? She thought a time. Seems I have. He done something down on the edge of Tennessee? Relation of Lee Bucks? Yes. What did he do? He killed my brother, for one thing. It was hard to make her tongue move with unconcerned glibness and remember to try to talk like Corey. Don't start breaking the law around here, me with this baby. Don't worry, lady. I got myself debitized. But if I was you, lady, I'd take that young'un and get on home. I can't till my man comes. 
Pete, run hunt Les and tell him to get himself on here and tell your pappy a man wants to see him and tell Hayes Cow his wife's a setting a waiting with the babies for him. A mule pawed the ground, high spirited in the cold. She looked at it. And tell Herb Cow his mules are trying to break loose. Herb Cow had no mule, but that did not matter. Pete scuttled into the darkness. The shadows drew together. You needn't have gone to so much trouble, lady, the tall one said. We ain't a wantin' to see all them cows. When you see one, you see em all. My man's took up with em, though the Lord knows I don't want him to. I've heard they're a wild bunch. You heard right, lady. If you're deputized, why don't you take em all to jail? We ain't got no warrants, except em for this bledzo. The short man laughed softly, and if and ye did have the warrants. The tall man said nothing. He was no longer still, but restless, shifting from one foot to the other. They'll all be here directly. Maybe this Chris with them, Louisa told him. I wished you'd get him. I get afraid with so many murderers around. She could feel the men watching her. To tell you the truth, lady, you've sort of messed things up. Me? I was trying to help. If he's with them, you can pick him out, can't you? It wouldn't be so easy. I ain't seen him in a long spell. He had a beard, too, the last time. Wore it on purpose, I always thought. You was hoping just to spy on Lee Buck quite like and maybe see this Chris by himself? The tall man was silent. The short man shoved his hands in his pockets and whistled, two little girls in blue. He broke off suddenly. Be a fool if you want to, but me, I think I'll be going. The tall man swore. The other said, excuse him, lady, but did not go. What's the hurry, she wanted to know. They'll be here any minute. We know that, lady, the short man said. His voice sounded as if all the whistling and laughter were gone from it. She heard footsteps, a great many, it seemed. Something ominous about so many footsteps coming steadily closer out of the darkness with no slackening or hastening or lights or laughter or man voices walking with them. She turned her back on the men and looked hard into the shadow from which the steps sounded, but the red light of the bonfire did not shine so far, and among the little trees the starlight was dim. It seemed that the feet could have gone to eternity and back before man shadows emerged from the tree shadows and she could see Chris walking in front with Lee Buck and Hayes each on a side. She hated him for a moment. Why must he have come? He might have slipped away. He couldn't do that. Funny how people were made. He was doing the only thing he could do. She let him come a little nearer. Funny how she was made. One part of her moved free and detached. She could look at the stars. There was the Big Dipper. The two stars in the handle pointed to the North Star. Chris had showed her that one night when they had stood together on Hayes' back porch waiting for Corey. Jack had been sick with croup and Sally had sent for Corey. Jack was a healthy child but croupy. Croupy children made a deal of uneasiness, Corey said. Rye had been croupy, but not the others. Beetle was the healthiest. She was heavy, too. Beetle made her arms ache. She remembered then. Chris and Lee Buck and Hayes stepped into the first faint outer circle of firelight. Beetle was too heavy. She took a stumbling step toward the three men and the River Meese boys and the Peter L.G. Cow men, Davy's brother, not dead, but living, in little log cabins on Kinder's Mountain and Pig Waller Knob. Are you there, Les? she called. My arm is clean broke from holding this baby so long. He's here, Lee Buck said, and his voice was hard and sharp with anger, as if he too hated Chris for doing the only thing he could. She stepped quickly. It was good to move. Beetle awoke and cried, frightened of the arms that held her so rigidly. She cried still when Louisa reached Chris and handed her to him. He was slow about taking the child. Louisa knew he did not want to. Maybe stood there and hated her for what she was trying to do. Beetle would not lie on his arm as he would have her do, but fully awake and rid of her tears, caught him about the neck, put, putting her head first on one side of his chin and then the other. 
Lee Buck and Hayes and the other men walked past them, and Chris tried to, but she stood in front of him, arranging Beetle's blankets. He stepped around her, and she caught his arm, but he shook her hand away and walked on toward the two men who were hunting him. She heard Lee Buck speak, and her fear for Chris seemed a small thing, swallowed up as it was in a new and greater fear for not one but many men. He only said, Somebody want Lee Buck Calhoun? But his voice was softer than she had ever thought any man's could be. It could not have been heard a half a dozen paces off, and it was flat and toneless and cold, and held a threat without a threatening tone. The tall man laid a hand on Ma's neck and smoothed it to the stirrup leather before answering. We wasn't wantin' you if you be Lee Buck. You know I reckon who we want. I might and I mightn't, Lee Buck said. We've had on good word that he stays with you. Maybe he does and maybe he don't. Why don't you come over and see? Come tonight. I'll give you a mule if you're walking. Not tonight, the tall man said. Better come on, Lee Buck urged softly. It'd give you a good start for looking in the morning. Be more fit than that so many women folks and youngins about. Pete stood unnoticed, looking up into the men's faces. You've plumb scared Sue Annie to death, he said. The short man looked at him. You aim to grow up and be like your kin, Sonny? You've made a good start this night. I hope so. Pete answered soberly. Better come and go long home with me, Lee Buck urged again. Not tonight, the tall man answered, but I will come some day. Certain? For certain. We'll be a looking then and treat you right when you come, Lee Buck said. Beetle gurgled into Chris's neck and he swung her away and held her on his arm. The short man glanced at him briefly, but the other one, with eyes only for Lee Buck, said, well, I reckon we'll be getting along. Don't hurry, Lee Buck said. Maybe he's at church and come out to this mule like you thought. That is his sorrel right there. I doubt it, he answered, and followed the other man into the deeper shadow. No one spoke for a time. Arthur Meese took a juice harp from his jumper pocket, rubbed it on his sleeve, and began to play. I never knew what true love meant till I courted in the rain. It's a good thing you brought out the youngins and seed him, Sue Annie, Hayes said. Lee Buck stared into the shadow that had swallowed up the men. I reckon you can start home with the youngins now. Corey and them will carry on half the night. You take a mule and two youngins, and Chris will take a mule and two youngins. It'll be better a riding with ye and the babies than a walking with winds. Louisa got on Kate, and Lee Buck handed up her share of the children taking care to fasten quiet who was already half asleep with a length of fodder binding wrapped about her middle and tied to the saddle she was glad to ride away the mule stepped slowly and carefully as it if conscious of the complete helplessness of her burden for at the least stumble or jump on the mule's part louisa was certain she would fall off with beetle in her arms However, as the road lengthened behind them and nothing happened, she felt a growing sense of security. Some strength returned to her arms, and she even dared to shift the baby about a bit. She was glad that the night was dark and that the road, for the most part, led up the dry creek bed of a narrow, twisting valley. The men would not follow over such a road. The walls of the valley broke high against the stars, and the stars were big and bright, falling like a roof onto the shoulders of the hills. The darkness was heavy, and nowhere was there light except the bright points overhead and the faint glimmering of limestone rocks in the road. By her side was a moving spot of lightness that was a baby's blanket, but of the one who held it, or the mule, or Pete, she could see nothing. In spite of what they said, those men would not try again. They were too frightened. It was pleasant to be riding in the dark, wrapped in a feeling of safety, hearing nothing but the squeak of saddle leather and the breathing of the mules. Odd and disconcerting to feel so completely at ease on a mule's back with a baby in your arms and a man by your side. What if the man were her husband and the child her own? Would she feel different, or would that feeling of safety, of security, of fulfillment almost be with her always? 
She thought of the other women with children in their arms who had come over this road before her a hundred years ago, 50 years ago, this evening. They too must have known trouble and fear for their men. What were their secret wifely thoughts? Did they feel secure and safe and filled with husband and children or were they like herself, empty, trying to live so as to feel nothing, watching, thinking? This is not my life. I am preparing for my real life. Someday I shall live and be a success. I am already ashamed that I was so frightened a little while ago over a man who is nothing to me. But I will remember that I once rode unafraid in the dark and carried a baby in my arms. Once home, she almost wished that she and Chris had waited for the others. She disliked being alone with him. He was no more silent than usual, but never before had she read things into his silence as she was doing now. He seemed to wish to avoid her, making trips to the woodpile for wood until the chimney corner was stacked high with it. When he had finished with that, he did not sit down, but stood looking into the fire. Beetle whimpered, and she rocked her without singing until she fell asleep. I'll put her down, he said, and took the baby and laid her on the bed. She got up when he returned to the fire. Uh, you're not angry with me, are you, Chris, because of what I tried to do? She asked, heedless of Pete and Quiet, who sat on the hearth, crunching parched corn. He smiled a little. Why, no, teacher, I'm not mad. What made you think it? She pitied the weakness in her that made this man's pleasures and displeasures matter so, that made her too glad when he smiled. Well, you didn't say anything, and you didn't stay away, and uh, I thought you were going to throw Beetle on the ground when I handed her to you. I might have, if that had been the right man. I come on with the others to see. There is a another man besides the two tonight they don't hardly count just deputies the short one thought he knowed me but was afraid and the tall one didn't know there is a daughtry man bill daughtry he wants to see me i know i want to see him too she felt very tired tonight was not an ending it was the beginning you think he'll come here this man can't tell. He's not one for staying away. He'll know that I'm here now. I reckon he's had them others watching at meeting all this time. You could hide. I couldn't do that. You see, I want to see this man. I will go to him at home, but let that man that fiddled in the other end bring him here. She felt the sting of tears on her eyelids and winked them away. That is why you don't care what the Barnetts do or tell, and you are glad you are not taken tonight so, so, so you can see this other man? He frowned a little. If you want to put it that way, yes. But I'm glad in other ways, in the same ways you'd be glad. Nobody wants to be took. No, they wouldn't. Wow, what a chapter. Very exciting chapter from the crazy stuff at the church with uh, Corey beating on the lady <laughs> in the midst of shouting. Uh, that would have been a real scene, huh? To the men trying to get Chris. Very exciting chapter. I loved all of it. Um, I, the writer, Arno is just so descriptive. I could just literally see it all from the dark, dusky dark. We would say dusky dark. She said dusty dark. Dusky dark uh, trip to the church and then them going home on the mules afterwards after they had uh, managed to get away from the men uh, that were looking for Chris. And wasn't Louisa, she was smart to think of that. She was really smart to come up with that on the spur of the moment. So, and again, showing her bravery, she was very brave to go up to those men that she didn't know and, and pretend that she was someone else looking for her husband less. So that was really interesting. I love the song, the mentions of the songs just because music is such a huge part of my life. So the song, Just Beyond the um, Starlit Skies, 
that I have a video of, that pa of Pap and Paul I'll link to so you can hear that song. It is a beautiful song. Twilight is Stealing is the name of it. Just beautiful, beautiful song. A really old song. And then the altar call, the Oh Why Not Tonight. I have one of uh, Pap and his brother singing that one that I'll link to that one. A very mournful a tune to really pull at your heartstrings that's often used as altar call in my area of Appalachia at least. So those things really jumped out at me. Uh, the, where she talks about if before the uh, scary stuff happens with the men when she's talking about the next day if they get to go hunting chestnuts and chinky pins. So chinky pins is a native nut. Um, you can hardly find them today, but they still do grow in, in parts of Appalachia. Not really a tree as much as either a small tree or more like, a, I guess you'd say a small tree, but they're kind of a nut like a chestnut, except really small, a really tiny one. And when I was growing up, with my dark eyes, people often told me, older people would often tell me that I had chinky pin eyes because my eyes were like two little chinky pins. Um, and you don't hear people talk about chinky pins uh, very much today. So I liked that part. Uh, I really enjoyed that. And then uh, it's the part kind of the exchange back and forth between Lee Buck Cow and the men that were hunting Chris, how even them, Lee Buck Cow said, you better come go home with us. Now, if they'd went home with him, I'm not sure what would have happened because maybe there was a, some threat behind that. But even there, that um, habit or mannerisms or, or sense of hospitality was so strong that even to the person that was hunting Chris, he had to say, you better come home with it, go home with us. Uh, you ought to just stay, all those things. Kind of like Samantha T when, uh, and Louisa when they were kind of in that little tiff. Those um, decorum or whatever you would call it is so strong that even in those situations of great tension, they fall back on that. So uh, I found, found that really interesting. But I hope you enjoyed this chapter. Very exciting. Uh, please leave a comment and tell me the things that you enjoyed about it. And I hope that you'll tune back in so we can see what happens next in Mountain Path.